Hi everyone, so today I will be discussing the June 2022 statistics paper 2. Uh, okay, question number one. Uh, they say the independent random variables W and X have the following distribution. So W follows a Poisson distribution with mean 4 and X follows a binomial distribution. So here N is 3 and probability of success is 0 0.8. <clears throat> okay, so you have a Poisson distribution and a binomial distribution. Okay, so part A, write down the value of the variance of W. Okay, so this is uh, pretty much straightforward, right? So variance of the Poisson distribution, you know, variance and mean are both equal to the lambda value, right? So that's theory. So here our lambda value is 4, which means variance of W is equal to 4, right? That's straightforward. Okay, part B. So they say here, determine the mode of X. Show your working clearly. Okay, so for two marks, we have determined the mode of X. Okay, so what do you mean by the mode? Now, when you talk about x, you know x follows a binomial distribution. And uh, what are our x values? So, when you say x is 3, you know in the binomial distribution, it's the number of successes. So, here n is 3 means what are the possible values for x? x can take any value in between, uh, any value, uh, it could be any one of 0, 1, 2, or 3, right? That's what you mean when you have 3 here. x could take any one of these values. So, if you could have 0 successes, you could have 1 success. Two successes or all three successes. That's that's what it means, right? Okay, so basically mode means what? Mode is the x value that occurs most often, the most occurring x value, right? So that's uh, so you out of these x values. Now you know your x can take one of zero, one, two, and three. So what is the x value that occurs most often? So how do you find that? How do you find which x value is most likely? under uh, the probability, under this particular measure. So the probability measure here is 0 0.8. So how, uh, which uh, one of these X values is more likely? So how do you do that? You have to calculate the individual probabilities of each and every single one of these X values. Okay, so you can see here, that's what I've done here. So for the binomial distribution, so this is the formula for the binomial distribution, right? So probability that your capital X variable takes a value, simple X can be any one of these values. So it's given by this formula, right? N x, n c x, p to the power x, 1 minus p to the power n minus x, right? So this is your binomial formula. So all you have to do here is uh, substitute uh, the x value, right? So you substitute uh, when x is 0, what do you get? So when x is 0, when you substitute the formula, yeah, n value is 3, right? So our n is 3, n c 0, p to the power x, p is 0 0.8 to the power x is here 0 into 1 minus 0 0.8 is 0 0.2 to the power n minus x. So that's uh, n is 3, 3 minus 0. All right, so here is substitute simple x as 0, n is 3, p is 0 0.8. Right, so you substitute that, type it in the cal, and you should get 1 over 125. Okay, similarly, you go for x equals 1. So when x equals 1, it's n c 1, 3 c 1, 0 0.8 to the power x, x is 1 into 1 minus 0 0.8 is 0 0.2 to the power n minus x. That's 3 minus 1, 3 minus 1 is 2. So likewise, you type it in the cal. Okay, so for each individual x value, you can calculate the probability, right? And you can, and you should be able to get these answers. Right? So that's really straightforward. So you should be able to get these answers. And then you can compare the probabilities. So when you compare the probabilities, it's, uh, you can easily see that uh, out of all these, x equals 3 has the highest probability, the highest occurring. So which means x equals 3 is the mode. So your answer for part B is x equals 3. Okay? Okay, so moving on to part uh, C, uh, one observation from each distribution is recorded as W1 and X1 respectively. Find the probability W1 equals 2 and X1 equals 2. Three marks, okay. So basically you need to first uh, find the probability of a single observation, W1 being equal to 2 and X1 being equal to. Okay, so let's first find the probability W1 equals 2. So how do you do that? W1 comes from the Poisson distribution. So from the Poisson distribution, uh, so what's the probability W equals to 2, right? So basically, you know, the Poisson distribution formula, e to the power minus lambda, lambda to the power x over x factorial. So simply you get this formula, substitute the lambda value here is 4, uh, x value here is 2, right? And it's just a matter of typing in the cal and you can get the individual probability for W1 equals 2. Agree? 
And uh, the next probability is x1 equals to 2. So that's the binomial probability. So x1 equals to actually we found it earlier itself, right? 48 over 125. So you just have to use this formula, right? N is 2, uh, N is 3, x is 2, p is 0 0.8. So you substitute those values, right? So it's, uh, that's really straightforward. Just substitute the formula and you get this value. And then uh, what are we supposed to do? You have to find the probability w1 equals 2 and x1 equals 2. So this is a, a, a quite a classic thing here, right? So you know if you have an and, and means you need both of them together at the same time. It's, uh, when you have and, the probabilities must be multiplied, right? So if they had an or here, if they instead of and, if it was an or, you would add the probabilities, right? But if it's an and, then you multiply. So those are the uh, rules that you need to uh, understand, like the simple rules here. So basically you multiply the answers you got, I multiply these two answers to get this. Okay, so I gave the answers to uh, four decimals. Okay, all right. Uh, so now we'll move on to part D. Okay, so part D, they ask you, uh, find the probability that X1 is less than W1. Okay, and it's four marks. So how do you find the probability X1 is less than W1? Okay, so the first thing you need to ask yourself here is, okay, so what are the possible values X1 can take? And what are the possible values W1 can take, right? Now, we know X1 comes from the binomial distribution, which means X1 can only take values either 0, 1, 2, or 3, right? Binomial distribution is a discrete distribution. And the number of successes, the maximum you have here is 3. So you can have uh, anything below that, any integer. So 0 successes, or 1, or 2, or 3. So those are the possible values X1 can take. But what about W1? the Poisson distribution, the number of events or whatever the event of interest. So what are the possible values W1 can take? So if you recall how the Poisson distribution works, you know, you can have zero, zero events of interest. Or you could have one, you could have two, you could have three. You know, in Poisson distribution, there's no upper bound, right? There is no upper bound because in binomial, you have a, a number of trials, you have a fixed number of trials. So you don't go beyond that. But in Poisson distribution, there is no upper bound has no fixed number of trials, right? So you only have a lambda a fixed uh, interval of success. But here you can see the number of successes in the interval, you can have as many, right? Even though it gets quite unlikely, but it's still uh, possible. So uh, so now the, pro the the question says you to find the probability that the X1 value is lower than W1, right? So what you need to do here is you need, uh, since W1, there is no end here, you can consider for X1, you can consider cases for X1. So for example, you can see I've considered cases here. First, I've considered what happens when X1 is zero. Okay, so I'm saying, okay, X1 is zero. And then what I want is I want the probability such that the X1 value is lower than W1. So in order for X1, if X1 is zero and I want it to be lower than W1, so what are the possible values W1 can take? So W1 can take any value. Uh, bigger than zero, right? Which means it can take values one, two, three, four, anything beyond any, any of those numbers bigger than one. Because I know W1 can take any figure, uh, any of the any integer value. So uh, if X1 is zero and I want X1 to be lower than W1, my W1 value should be greater than or equal one. Do you agree? So this is the first thing you should understand. So if you get that, then getting the probability is easy, right? So it's an and here. So because I need both of them to happen together, X1 should be zero and W1 should be greater than or equal one. Okay, so if that happens, then this condition is satisfied for one case, okay? So then what I do is X1 equals zero probability we already found previously, right? That's one over 125 and means I multiply. Uh, so what about the probability W1 is greater than or equal one? Uh, so how do I get the probability W1 is greater than or equal one? Uh, so you know, uh, in Poisson distribution, so if W1 greater than or equal 1 is equal to 1 minus probability W is less than or uh, equal to 0. But you know, less than or equal 0, you only have 0, right? These values do not take negative integers. So probability W equals 0. That's all, right? W greater than or equal 1 is 1 minus probability W less than or equal to, you know, 1 integer below that. So these are rules, rules that we've discussed in uh, uh, S2 chapter 2. Right, and chapter one, so for discrete distributions, you need to know how to convert greater than probabilities to less than probabilities, okay? Uh, so these are the, these are some rules that we've discussed previously. 
So uh, basically, I, I get this and W equals zero. You know, we can get it using the formula to the power minus lambda, lambda to the power x over x factorial. So you can type it and you can get this figure, right? So when you type this in the cal, uh, e to the power minus 4 into 4 to the power 0 over 0 factorial, you should be able to get 0 0.0183. So basically, uh, 1 minus that figure into 1 over 125. Okay, so that's this case. And then similarly, I need to consider other cases for x1 as well, right? Because x1 can also take the value 1. So what happens if x1 becomes 1? And then what are the possible values w1 can take such that x1 is smaller than W1. So you can see if X1 is 1, then W1 has to take values greater than or equal to 2. Right? In that case, X1 value is smaller than whatever values W1 takes because W1 I'm going to take probabilities where it's bigger than or equal to 2. Okay? So again, you can see I've taken here X1 equal 1 probability I have already found. That's 12 over 125 into W1 greater than or equal to 2. So that again, that probability W greater than or equal to can be found by 1 minus probability W is less than or equal to 1. Right? Do you agree? And W less than or equal 1 probability, you can find it uh, from the Poisson cumulative distribution tables, right? So, you know, in the uh, uh, in the formula book, right? So, in your formula book, if you turn to the, uh, uh, the Poisson uh, cumulative distribution page with lambda equals to 4, so you should be able to find it, right? So here, let me show it quickly. Yeah, so this is the binomial. So I'm going for the Poisson table. So this is the Poisson cumulative distribution function. Lambda value is 4. Uh, so actually, x equals 0 value is also here, right? 0 0.0183. Even that value, I could have got it from the table. So the next one, when x is 1, so this is cumulative. So x equals 1 here means you take the value of x less than or equal 1, right? So that, that answer here is 0 0.0916. So you can see I've written that here, 0 0.0916. Okay? Let me see again, W less than or equal 1. And then you put it into this, so 1 minus this guy, right? Because W greater than or equal to is 1 minus W less than or equal 1. W less than or equal 1 is 0 0.0916. Okay, and you get this. And then again, we consider the next case. What's the next case? When X1 is equal to 2. Okay, as I told you, you have to consider uh, the X case for 0, 1, 2, 3. All the four cases need, need to be considered. And for each X case, you have to say what are the possible W values in order you, for, uh, in order to satisfy this particular inequality. Okay, so if X1 is 2, then your W values must be greater than or equal to 3. Right, then this inequality, X1 will be lower than W1. And then X1 equals 2 probability, I again found it here. So that's uh, 40 to 125. And W1 greater than or equal to 3 is 1 minus W1 is less than or equal to 2. So W1 less than or equal to 2 probability under lambda 4. So you can see that 0 0.2381, right? In 0 0.2381, you can see where I'm moving the cursor, right? 0 0.2381. So uh, that's what I have written here, 0 0.2381. And the last case, when X1 equals to 3, that's the biggest x value that uh, the value x can take. The w value should be greater than or equal to 4. So x1 equals 3, 64, 125. And w1 greater than or equal to 4 is 1 minus the w1 less than or equal to 3. So w1 less than or equal to 3 probability is 0 0.4335. Okay, can you see here? This is the 3. And this is the lambda value is 4. So 0 0.4335. All right. Uh, so we multiply each of these, uh, I mean, you get the answer for each of these branches and you know what you should do right? at the end, you should add all of them up because these are all possible, uh, all different possibilities, like they are different branches of a tree diagram because you don't get x1 equals 0 and x1 equals 1 at the same time, right? So if you get x1 equals 0, then that's one path. Or you could get x1 equals 1 and then W has to satisfy this particular inequality. If x1 is 2, w has to satisfy this particular inequality. So these are di different branches. So you get the probability along each branch and you add them all up in order to get the complete probability for x1 less than w1, which is, uh, so this is just typing in the calculator that 0 0.6777, okay?
Uh, actually, it's, uh, we need to keep our answers to three as a finalist, otherwise stated, right? So that's given in the instructions in the paper. So this should be given as 0 0.6777. Uh, so that should be 0 0.678. Okay. So they tell you to keep our answers, final answers to three as unless otherwise stated. That's a part of the instruction in the beginning of the page. Uh, so here also, yeah, this is three as already, right? Yeah. So I don't need to change that. All right. So this, these are the final answers. Okay, so let's move to the next question. Okay, moving on to question two. Uh, the time in minutes spent waiting for a call to a call center to be answered is modeled by the random variable capital T with probability density function f of t equals 1 over 192 t cubed minus 48 t plus 128. And you can see t takes values between 0 and 4. Right, it, it is uh, greater than or equal to zero, less than or equal to four, or zero otherwise. Uh, use algebraic integration to find in minutes and seconds the mean waiting time. Okay, so you, you have to find the uh, mean waiting time in minutes and seconds. Okay, so how do you find the mean? So you know mean expected value, right? The expected value of the variable is capital T. So the rule is you integrate it by uh, how how does the uh, how do you get the mean? So you take it as uh, T times Ft, right? Xfx. And your integration limits are from 0 to 4, right, guys? So this is the uh, equation. Okay, so the same formula for Ex. Uh, it's just the same thing uh, with T here. Okay, so let's input the values. So using in integration, so T times f of t is uh, 1 over 192 uh, t cube minus 48 t uh, plus 128 dt. So let's uh, simplify 1 over 192. We can take it out. So this is going to be t to the power 4. I multiply the t outside. Uh, so t to t cube is t to the power 4 minus 48 t square plus 128 t. All right, so uh, now we can integrate. So t to the power 5 over 5 minus 48 t cube over 3 plus 128 t square over 2 limits from 0 to 4, right? All right, so now let's input the uh, limits. All right, so you can see I've done the rest of it. Uh, just substitute the t value as 4. Okay, so the first limit is 4 minus the t value is 0. And then you can simplify with the calculator. So you get the answer for this expression as 16 or 15. And here they say the time in minutes, right? Which means you get your answer in minutes. Uh, so the question says to, uh, to find the uh, mean uh, in minutes and seconds. So basically, you have to give the uh, time in both minutes and seconds. So you have 16 or 15 minutes. So we can convert it, right? So uh, let's get the uh, amount in minutes and seconds. So how do you do that? Okay, so if you type 16 or 15 in your calculator and get the decimal figures, I think you get something like 1.06666 is goes on, right? That many minutes. So which means you have one complete minute, right? There's one complete minute and the rest of the thing you need to convert to seconds. So here you have one minute. Okay, and to convert the rest of it, so what you can do is, this, uh, I mean, get the full figure in your calculator. Okay, so you don't have to remove any recurring part. So when you get this 1.0666, it goes on. You can remove, you can subtract one. Okay, you can subtract one to get the zero point, I mean, to get this 0 0.0666 part. And you multiply that by 60. And then you immediately get 4. So it's going to be 1 minute and 4 seconds. And we just do, do the conversion in an easy way. Okay, so 16 or 15 minutes is 1 minute and 4 seconds. Okay, part B, this is show that the probability greater than 1, less than 3, equals 7 over 16. Okay, so how do you find the probability? Again, it's really uh, straightforward. You just have to uh, integrate between the limits 1 to 3, right? <clears throat> uh, so, uh, I integrate the function 1 over 192 
t cube minus 48t plus 128 uh, from 1 to 3. Okay. All right. So uh, we get here. So just integrate and, you know, substitute the value that's like, it should be really straightforward. So 1 over 192. And you get here uh, t to the power 4 over 4 minus 48 t square over 2 plus 128 t, right? Between the limits 1 and 3. So just uh, <clears throat> substitute the limits, right? Okay. Yeah, so uh, let's get the answer. Okay, so uh, just uh, so you can see I've written the rest of it, just substituting T as 3 minus and substituting T as 1, and you can get the final answer, right? So this is the uh, answer. So you should get uh, 7 over 16 without much trouble. Okay, so uh, now let's move on to part C. Uh, okay, so they, in part C they say, uh, a supervisor randomly selects 256 calls uh, uh, to the call center. Use a suitable approximation to find the probability that more than 125 of these calls take between 1 and 3 minutes to be answered. All right. So you can see it's 5 marks. And, and, and obviously, you can see they ask you to use an approximation, right? So, uh, so what is the initial distribution? Okay, so you can see there are uh, 256 calls. The supervisor randomly select 256 calls, right, to the call center. Use a suitable approximation to find the probability that more than 125 of these calls, so out of 256, right, 125 of these calls take between 1 to 3 minutes. So you, sh you should be able to map out different things here. Taking between 1 to 3 minutes is what you have in part B, right? So in part B, you have calls that last between uh, the probability that a call would last between one to three minutes. And now in here, so in order to use a suitable approximation, so the first thing that runs through your mind should be, uh, I mean, obviously you need to realize that you have to use one of the two distributions, either binomial or poison, right? You need to realize because you are working with the number of calls now, not the length of the call. Length of the call is a, uh, is a uh, continuous distribution. But when you go to number of calls, that's discrete. So number of calls is discrete, which means you're going to work with either poison distribution or binomial. So when they say they, they, there are the supervisor selects uh, 256 calls and you are trying to find the probability how much out of that 125 or more. Okay, so immediately you need to identify, okay, so we have a fixed number of trials. Because in binomial, you have a set number of trials, right? In, in poison distribution, you don't have that. You have a success rate over a particular interval. Okay, but here you have a fixed number of trials. So immediately you need to realize, okay, we are going to work with the binomial distribution and the probability of success is what you have uh, for the calls that take between one to three minutes. So the probability of success is what you have found in part B, which is 7 over 16. So that's what you need to realize. Okay, so let's uh, define a random variable. Uh, so let's say, uh, okay, we have not used any other variable. So we can use X, right? X is not used. So X is the number of calls, uh, number of calls that take, that take between one and three minutes. Okay, so we are working with the number of calls, a discrete distribution. X is the number of calls. Okay, number of calls that take between one and three minutes. So X follows a binomial distribution. What's the fixed number of trials? 256 and probability of success is 7 over 16 because 7 over 16 is the probability that a call lasts between 1 and 3 minutes from part B. Okay, so what are we supposed to do? We're supposed to uh, use an approximation, a suitable approximation to find the probability that more than 125 of these calls take between 1 and 3 minutes. All right, so now we need to decide uh, on the approximation. So binomial approximation can go two ways. So you can have binomial to poison approximation or binomial to Normal approximation, right? So there were there are rules that we've discussed previously. So binomial to poison, n is large, p is small, right? So if you check seven over sixteen, the decimal figure is zero point four three seven five. 
right? The decimal figure of 706 means 0 0.4375. Good. Okay, so n is large, p is small. That is the uh, requirement for the approximation from binomial to poison. The other one is from binomial to uh, normal distribution. The condition is n is large, p is close to 0 0.5. Right, so I'm just uh, telling, uh, you know, telling these things out of memory, uh, which these are, you find these rules in your textbook. Okay, you find these rules in your textbook given exactly as I say. Okay, n is large p close to 0 0.5 means you go with the normal distribution. So you can see 0 0.4375 can, is kind of pretty close to uh, 0.5, right? So, so even if you take the uh, np value, if you multiply the np value, that also gives you a clue. n is 256 into 7 over 16. If this value is bigger than 10, because np is the lambda value in poison, right? So if you multiply 256 into 7 over 16, that also that gives you a value of 112. So normally for poison distribution, the NP value should be, in order to go for a poison distribution, the NP value or the lambda value should be lesser than or equal to 10, usually, right? So because our uh, poison tables only go on to lambda value 10. So when you see the NP value like uh, such a uh, large one, you should immediately understand, okay, we need to go for a, uh, a normal approximation. So you have to go for a normal approximation. So now let's approximate this by using a normal approximation. So you have to get the mean and the variance. So what is the mean? So mean is NP, binomial distribution mean is NP. So that I just found here, right? 112 mean and variance. Variance is NP one minus P. So N is 256. Uh, P is 7 over 16 into 1 minus 7 over 16, right? Uh, so that gives me uh, uh, 63. Let's check on this again. Yeah, so this value is correct, right? So you can type it out. So basically, x, uh, the approximation of x follows a normal distribution with mean 112 and variance 63. All right, so now let's uh, find the probability. What probability do we need to find? We have using the approximation, we have to find the probability that more than 125 of these calls take between this many minutes. Okay, so the minutes have already been considered. So I need to find the probability that more than, say so x is greater than 125. I had to find this probability. So when I'm trying to find this probability, uh, so again, another important rule to remember is when you're jumping the uh, boundary from discrete to continuous. So I'm taking a continuous dis uh, uh, discrete distribution, a binomial distribution to a continuous distribution, a normal distribution. So you must apply a continuity correction, right? So you need to recall these rules. So you apply continuity correction when you're finding the probabilities when you take an approximation from binomial to normal or Poisson to normal, okay? So you must remember to apply continuity correction. So I need to get the probability x greater than 125. So applying continuity correction gives me what? So x is greater than 125, right? So you can take you take the two figures, uh, 0.5 behind 125. So it's 125.5 or 124.5. So x is greater than 125. So which figure do you take? x greater than 125.5 or 124.5? So you can take the x figure that doesn't include the 125, right? So it should be x is greater than uh, 125.5. Okay, so we need to take greater than 125 point because x greater than 125 doesn't include the value here. Okay, if you take x greater than 124.5, that will include the 125, right? So don't take that. So you should take x greater than 125.5. Okay, so for the continuity correction. All right, and then, uh, so now I have to find the probability of x greater than 125.5 using a normal distribution. So we can convert this to a standard normal. So how do you convert to standard normal? You uh, x you subtract from the mean and divide by the standard deviation. So x value 125.5, I subtract from the mean 63, divide by the standard deviation, sorry, subtract from the mean, which is uh, 112, and divide from the standard deviation, which is uh, square root of 63. So this is x minus mu over sigma is my z value. So this figure, you can take it, right? So you would have to type it out in the calculator. You can get the figure. 
and then you can uh, get get the uh, probability either by using the calculator or by using the uh, normal distribution table. So any one of the two methods. Let's get the answer here. Okay, so for this part, I get the value of uh, 1.7008. Okay, so you can get the figure. So this answer you can find by using the tables or by using the calculator. So I just, uh, I'll just take it from this uh, calculator that I'm using. So I'll go for the stat mode. Okay, and I'm not going to go for any of the options here. So now it depends on the type of calculator you use, the options you, uh, the path you have to go might be different. Okay, so for this cal, I go for the stat mode and I don't select any of the options they've given me and I go for shift and number one to go for the uh, stat uh, options here. Okay, and that gives me all these options. So I go for distribution number five and here, so this is where you need to uh, end up in every calculator. Uh, to get the probability. So P represents the probability behind the line. Okay, so if I go for P, then P gives me the probability behind. So if I give uh, P and type the value 1.7008, I'll get the probabilities, uh, the probability uh, behind, the total area behind 1.7008. Okay, but I want the area in front of it. Actually, I want the Z greater than. So this is the the answer I got here is why Z less than 1.7008. So in order to make it uh, what I want, I'll take, turn to one minus probability Z less than 1.7008. Now these are uh, discrete. Uh, these are I'm working with continuous distributions here, right? So it doesn't matter with the inequality mark. The less than or equal. So if you want, you can put the equal mark here. It does not make a difference with uh, with continuous distributions, right? So one minus the uh, calculator answer can be used now. One point seven zero zero eight zero point nine five five one. All right. So uh, so it depends on. Uh, I mean, you can use more decimals here to get uh, get it correct. Okay. Uh, I think uh, one more adjustment that we can do here is uh, let's actually give the Z value as 1.70. Okay, because if you are using the tables, uh, you can only go for 1.70, right? We are using the uh, by by uh, normal tables. So uh, let's go with that. Okay, instead of giving the extra figures here. Okay, so go for 1.70. Actually, that would be uh, better because your tables in the book uh, in your formula sheet can only go for this much, right? one point when you're taking the z value so then i would get the value 0 0.95543 so let's go with that 0 0.9554 okay so then that gives me the answer uh, 0 0.0446 all right so uh so this is the final answer All right, moving on to question number three. A point is to be randomly plotted on the x-axis where the units are measured in centimeters. The random variable capital R represents the x-coordinate of the point on the x-axis and capital R is uniformly distributed over the interval minus five comma 19. Okay, so uh, the point capital, uh, the point x is, uh, has, a, has a uniform distribution over minus five nineteen. A negative value indicates that the point is uh, to the left of the origin. So a negative uh, value means it's to the left and a positive value means the point is to the right of the origin. Okay, so that's uh, the, the usual the usual things that we understand. Part A, find the exact probability that the point is plotted to the right of the origin. So if you want to find the probability the point is plotted to the right of the origin, so what do you need to do? So you can see here I have actually plotted the uniform distribution, right? And so a uniform distribution starting from minus 519 and you know, a uh, uniform distribution is a rectangular distribution, right? So this value here is one over B minus A. This is one over B minus A. And you know, this is the A value and this is the B value. So B minus A, 19 minus minus five, that's 24. So one over B minus A, one over 19 minus minus five is one over 24, right? So those are uh, like the, the basic stuff in the uniform distribution. And then, uh, so I, I draw the line from minus 519, the, uh, the, the height of the line uh, is 1 over 24, all right? Okay, so I want to find the probability the point is plotted to the right of the origin. So right of the origin means 
Now, if they say here, <coughs> right of the origin means after zero, right? So basically, I need to find this area because you know in uh, in these uh, continuous distributions, so the area represents the probabilities, right? So I simply need to find its probability. Uh, all I need to do is the, the, the probability that the point is plotted to the right of the origin. So I need to just get this full area, right? I just need this full area. So how do I get that full area? Area of the rectangle length into breadth. So length is 19, right? So 0 to 19, that's 19 units. And height is 1 over 24. So 19 into 1 over 24 is 19 over 24. And it's just one mark. Right? So it's like really uh, straightforward. You don't have to even draw the graph. So you can simply see it. Okay? It's uh, uh, I was just explaining the whole process to make it easier to understand, but you can think of it from your head and just write 9 over 24 immediately. You don't have to go for any other thing. Okay, so they'll immediate, you'll immediately get the full mark. Okay, now part B, find the exact probability that the point is plotted more than 3.5 centimeters away from the origin. Okay, so they wanted to find the probability that the point is plotted more than 3.5 centimeters away. So more than 3.5 centimeters away gives you how many options? So when they say more than 3.5 centimeters away from the origin, it could be to either side. It could be to the left side more than 3.5 or to the right side more than 3.5. So you can see what I'm doing here. I'm going to mark the point 3.5. Okay, so more than 3.5 from the origin. So the right side is the positive 3.5, to the left side is the negative 3.5. Right, so basically the point is plotted more than 3.5 centimeters away from the origin gives me these two areas. Do you agree? I get this area and I get this area. So this gives me the probability that the point is plotted more than 3.5 centimeters away from the origin, right? So from the origin, 3.5 the right side and I get the area in front of 3.5 or uh, I go 3.5 centimeters back. So that's negative 3.5 and I go back where until the graph ends to so this area. So End of the day, all I have to do is to add, add these two areas. Okay, so I add those two areas, and you can see here how I've gotten it. So I just take the, took the area of the two rectangles. 19 minus 3.5 is the length, and the width of the rectangle is 1 over 24, right? And I add that with the area of the other rectangle. The other rectangle, the width, uh, so you, you, you know you are just taking a length here. The negative signs are not going to make an impact. So just take the difference between 5 and 3.5. Difference between 5 and 3.5 is 1.5. Okay, you don't you don't use negatives here. Okay, you're, ta you're taking a length. A length is supposed to be a, a positive figure. So just take the length. Okay, magnitude. The length, uh, between the difference between 5 and 3.5 is 1.5. So I just take that length into width is 1 over 24. Right, so here I have the area of the two rectangles and I add them up to get me the uh, area I need. So I need to find the probability the point is plotted more than 3.5 centimeters away from the origin. So I get the areas of the two rectangles and I get what, what we require here. All right. Uh, moving on to part C. Uh, sketch the cumulative distribution function of R. Okay. So how do you sketch the cumulative distribution function? So they want you to sketch it. So before sketching it, let's first get the uh, equation. Okay, so how do you find uh, the cumulative distribution function, capital F of x? So you integrate the PDF. You integrate your PDF from the lower limit uh, to x, right? Uh, so basically, uh, the in order to get fx, capital fx, so what's our PDF, first of all? So you know the PDF, simple fx in the uniform distribution is 1 over b minus a, right? That's the PDF. So we found that 1 over b minus a value is what we have over here. So that's 1 over uh, 19 minus minus 5, which is 1 over 24. So this is the PDF, simply the PDF of the uh, uniform distribution. So that's why you have a, a horizontal line, right? 1 over 24 is a horizontal. This is the sketch of the PDF. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Okay. So then, uh, all right. And, and you get this. Okay, so this is the PDF, and then what you do is you integrate your PDF from the lower limit. So our lower limit is negative 5, and the upper limit is x, where x can be any figure, okay, where x is going to be any value between negative 5 and 19, right? So you know when you integrate this guy between negative 5 to x, so that if you input the x figure, any value between minus 5 and 19, you will immediately get the area behind that particular x value. 
right? So here, uh, the reason that, so you can see here, I've used here ds instead of dx because uh, the rule is that you don't use the same, uh, when the limit has a x, you don't also integrate with respect to x, okay? So otherwise, normally we use here dx, right? We integrate with respect to x. But over here, when our uh, limits also, when our limit also has a x, uh, you don't write x here, right? So you should write some any other letter, use any other letter, s or t, just use any letter, d, u, I don't mind. Use any letter other than S because you can see it does not affect the operation, right? So 1 over 24, when I integrate, I get 1 over 24, simply S, right? Because I'm doing it with respect to S. And then I can substitute the limit because I have to substitute uh, the, uh, the upper limit as X. So first I replace uh, the S value here with X, right? And then I substitute it with negative 5. Okay? And then you can get the uh, capital FX. So this is just the basic rule that you use to convert a PDF to the CDF. So you take your PDF, okay, and, and when you are converting PDF to CDF, you use definitely a try, integrate with a different, I mean, uh, go with another letter, DS or DT. Okay, that's the, the, the proper way of doing it actually. Okay, because if you use X here, you can see when you use DX here, you get uh, X here. So then, that, you know, it's not technically wrong, but you are just using, again, X instead of X. So, Okay, it's not technically wrong, but this would be the, the most appropriate way of doing it. Okay. All right, so I get here x plus 5 over 24. Actually, you know, you can even get this answer by using the direct formula in your textbook. Fx is equal to uh, x minus a over b minus a, right? I think you have this. So I was just using the integration to get the answer. So x minus a is negative 5, so x minus minus 5 over b minus a is uh, 24, right? So you can get this exact same answer by using the formula in your textbook. But mm, because end of the day, they give you marks just for the sketch. The question, the, the question says to sketch the CDA function, right? Two marks. They just want to see the sketch. So you're not actually going to get any marks for any of these working. Okay, all you're going to get marked is for the sketch. So you need to show the sketch. So it's basically you can see, uh, so you can directly use this to actually write this down instead of going through this to save time, okay? Uh, and then uh, you can write, I mean, I, I have broken it up. So 1 over 24x plus 5 over 24 is simply a straight line. It's a straight line function. And you know the straight line function, you're supposed to draw for x values between minus 5 and 19. So you start at minus 5, you can start with x is negative 5. And when you use x as negative 5, you can see capital FX is 0. And at 19, capital FX is 1. Okay, so uh, if you are able to think a little bit further, you, you can see that you don't need any of these to actually sketch this. You don't need any of these things. You can, without doing any of these workings, you can directly sketch this because we understand the CDF function is always going to be, uh, if you recall, at the very beginning, CDF is always 0, right? CDF is a star, the, the probability. So at negative 5, since it's a continuous distribution, at negative 5, the single point negative 5 has zero probability. And you know, when you keep on going to the right, you keep on adding probabilities. And when you come to 19, you know you must reach the full probability of 1. So which means that at negative 5, you must have probability 0. And at 19, you must reach the full probability 1. And this has to be a straight line because it's a uniform distribution. That's the only catch here. Okay, so if you work with other distributions also, always starting where probability will be zero, ending will be one, but the graph might be looking different. The graph might be, you know, curved or, you know, it might have be a different shape, but in the uniform distribution, it will be a straight line. So you can understand from this, all right? But if you recall, if you are able to directly remember that it should be a straight line, you don't need to do any of this working. You can directly go for the graph. That's it, and that's all they want to see, right? This graph is what they want to see. So especially at 19, the probability value is 1. And at 5, negative 5 should be 0. The graph should not continue beyond that, those points. All right? All right, so moving on to part D. Uh, three independent points uh, with x coordinates, r1, r2, and r3, are plotted on the x-axis. Find the exact probability that all three points are more than 10 centimeters from the origin. Okay, so if you look at this graph, more than 10 centimeters from the origin, and you can see I've marked it here. So I think you can see you can only go more than 10 centimeters from the origin to the right side. So there's no point of discussing it to the left side. The left side is going only until negative five. So 
uh, if you are trying to go more than 10 centimeters away from the origin, it only works for the right side. Okay. So basically what you can do is first find a probability that one point. So instead of first going with three points, let's work with one point. So what's the probability that one point is going to be more than 10 centimeters away from the origin. So one point being more than 10 centimeters away from the origin is this area, right? The area that I'm shading right now. So this is the probability that a single point is more than 10 centimeters away from the origin. Okay, so uh, the contribution comes only from the right side. The left side is not involved now. Okay, so uh, how do you get the area? I mean, the probability, the probability you directly get it from the area. So that's 19 minus 10. Okay, 19 minus 10, that's the length into width is 1 over 24. Do you agree? So 19 minus 10, the width is 9. 9 into 1 over 24, that's 9 over 24. So this is the probability that, the, that a single point is more than 10 centimeters away from the origin. Right? Do you agree? So uh, the question is, however, to find uh, the probability that all three points should be more than 10 centimeters away from the origin. Not one point, but all three points. So you're going to take three points, R1, R2, R3. So I need R1 to be more than 10 centimeters, and I need R2 to be more than 10 centimeters, and I need R3 to be more than 10 centimeters. So all three should happen at the same time together. Right, so not one separately. I mean, everything needs to happen together at the same time. So if, if that is the case, then what do you do? You need to understand that the probabilities must be multiplied. So this is the probability of a single probability is greater than 10. So here I need the probability that R1 is greater than 10 and R2 is greater than 10 and R3 is greater than 10. Then, then I get, uh, then the, the, this is the case where I have all three are going to be more than 10 centimeters. So then basically 9 over 24 into 9 over 24 into 9 over 24. That is uh, 27 over 512 is the probability that all three points are more than 10 centimeters away from the origin. Okay. All right, guys, moving on to the last part, Roman number two, the point furthest from the origin is more than 10 centimeters from the origin. All right, so look at it again, the point furthest. So you know you have three points. The furthest point must be 10 centimeters away from the origin. The other two can be less than, right? So which means if I go through this figure, okay, and say my points are R1, R2, R3, okay? So let's say the points are R1, R2, R3. So the point furthest must always be more than 10 centimeters away, which means it has to be inside. So let's say the furthest point is, let's just assume that it is, uh, uh, okay, let's say that's R1. Okay, so the other two points, R2 and R3, okay, so the furthest point has to always be more than 10 centimeters away, which means it has to always be inside the box. While the other two points, R2 and R3, now they don't say that it's, it, it is necessarily inside or outside the box, right? So they just say very clearly the furthest point, okay, must be more than 10 centimeters from the origin, the furthest point, which means the other two points are closer to the origin, right? So R2 and R3 must be close to the origin, but the exact whereabouts, uh, it could be anywhere. So I could say, for example, R2 is inside here, R1 is here, right? Or I could say maybe both R1 and R2 are inside here. Both R1, R2 and R1 could be inside, or both R2 and R1 uh, could be here, could be outside. Like it could be anywhere. Right? The, the, the main requirement is the furthest point. In this case, I'm going to say it's R1. Let's say it's R1, okay, just to make things easier. The furthest point, R1, should it must be inside this particular rectangle, the box, the, the one that I've shared in, uh, in brown. R1 has to be in here. But R1 and R2, uh, R, R1 and R3, so basically this is R1, sorry, this is R2 and R3, right? R2 and R3, the other two points, R2 and R3, okay? R1 is always, the furthest point, let's say, is R1. R1 is always going to be inside the box. The other two points, R2 and R3, uh, we don't know the exact whereabouts, but they are going to be definitely close to the origin compared to R1. So R2, R3 could be, you know, at any place. So R2, R3, both could be inside the box behind, a little bit behind R1, or it could be outside. So, you know, you have different combinations. You have different, different combinations for these guys. Okay, so uh, basically, I think you can see it's going to be really tough if you try to think of the possible, uh, all the possible paths. If you try to think of all the possible paths for R1, R2, R3, it's going to be really difficult. Where is this possible? So the easiest way to actually do this sum is to think of 
the only path which is actually impossible. Okay, so what is the only path that is uh, not possible here? The only time where this is not going to work. So you need to think of the only time where it's not going to work. So the only time that uh, the problem, because we know the total probability is one. And from the total probability one, if we subtract the thing that we do not want, then we get what we require, right? So here, what do I not want? So if the furthest point is more than 10 centimeters away from the origin, okay, so what is it, what is the, uh, what path do I need to remove? So if you think, let's say the furthest point, what if the furthest point is less than 10 centimeters away? What can happen? So let's say this is my R1. So R1 is the furthest point. And if my furthest point is less than 10 centimeters away, then, uh, then by default, the other two points, R2 and R3, are also going to be behind, right? You know, R2, R3 should definitely be behind R1. Because I'm going to say R1 is the, uh, the furthest point. R2, R3 must definitely be behind, right? So in this case, you can see this is the particular path that we do not want, right? So uh, this is the path that I don't want. I mean, if this happens, then I cannot get this particular option, right? The question is the point furthest from the origin is more than 10 centimeters away. But if I take the point furthest from the origin is less than 10 centimeters, it means all the three points are going to be less than 10 centimeters because even they can even come over here, guys, okay? But you can see it's still less than 10 centimeters away from the origin. Do you agree? So basically, I'm going to take the probability, the, the one that we do not require. So I'll take the probability that the furthest point is less than 10 centimeters away, which, which, is, which is automatically, which automatically means that all three points are going to be less than 10 centimeters away. Okay, so that is the part that we do not require. So if we subtract that from the total probability one, we are going to get what we want. Okay, so for part two, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take from one, I'm going to subtract the probability that all three are going to be what? That all three are going to be less than uh, 10 centimeters. So this is the part that I do not require. All right, guys, it's a little bit of a tricky one. This is actually tricky. So this is greater than, so less than. So uh, I have the probability uh, uh, yeah, so you just have to uh, get R less than 10, probability R less than 10, and just have to take the power 3 of it, right? Because R greater than 10 is 9 over 24, R less than 10 should be the rest of the probability, right? So uh, 24 minus 9, that gives me 15. So 1 minus uh, 15 over 24 cube, right? So that gives me uh, 387 over 512. Okay, so this is quite a tricky one if you try to do it in the usual way, if you try to think of R1 here, and the possible questions of R2 and R3, it's going to be really difficult. Okay, so take the only option that you really do not want. Okay, but and in here, uh, all combinations are fine, right? Whether it's R1, because you can even think R2 could be the furthest point. R3 could be the furthest point. But regardless, whoever is the furthest point, if it's inside this, uh, if it's less than 10, right? If it's less than 10, then you can see that's the only option, the only path that we do not require here in this particular case. So I take that path and I subtract it from the total probability one. So then that gives me the, the probability of the event that we require. All right. So I hope that's clear with everyone. All right. So moving on to question number four. Uh, past evidence shows that 7% of pears grown by a farmer are unfit for sale. This season, it is believed that the proportion of pears that are unfit for sale has decreased. To test this belief, a random sample of n pairs is taken. The random variable y represents the number of pairs in the sample that are unfit for sale. Find the smallest value of n such that y equals 0 lies in the critical region for its test at a 5% level of significance. All right, so you need to find the uh, critical region, right? So basically, you have to do a hypothesis test. All right, so you need to first figure out the distribution, right? So you have, there are several things to figure out. You have, you have to figure out your random variable, the distribution, right? And then figure out the type of the test, whether it's a two-tailed test or one-tailed test, right? So let's uh, look at all this information again. So just three marks. 
So you have uh, the past evidence that shows 7% of pairs are unfit for sale. The, so here we believe the proportion of pairs that are unfit for sale has decreased. So here we have a belief. Okay, so probably we're going to test this belief. Okay, let's read on to test this belief. Okay, so we're going to test whether the uh, whether the pairs uh, that are unfit for sale, whether it has decreased. So this is what we are trying to test. Okay. Uh, so to test this belief, a random sample of n pairs is taken. Okay, so we are taking a n number. The random variable capital Y represents the number of pairs in the sample that are unfit for sale. So you can see immediately I'm writing that down. That's the first thing I, I'm taking, the noting down. Now uh, that my random variable is capital Y and that represents the number of pairs that are unfit for sale. And now I need to see, figure out the distribution that capital Y follows. I had to find the distribution of capital Y because that's the whole starting point. So capital Y, you can see how do you decide? Now, obviously, you know, this is going to be the number of pairs means uh, surely it has to be either binomial or poison because you're you are working with a discrete value, number of pairs, right? So it has to be uh, a discrete uh, distribution. So it has to be, you have to decide between binomial and poison. How do you decide between the two of them? So they say here to test this belief, a random sample of n pairs is taken. So you're taking a fixed number, right? You're taking a fixed number and you're sampling from that. You're checking from that. And they also say from the past evidence, 7% of pairs grown by a farmer are unfit for sale. So this is the probability of the uh, pairs that are unfit. So basically here you have the probability of success in this case, the pairs that are unfit for the sale. So basically you have Y, so you need to realize, okay, it's not a Poisson distribution, it has to be a binomial distribution and the number of trials is n, probability of success, or in this case, the, the probability that pairs are unfit for sale is 0 0.07. All right, so this is the first thing you figure out. And the next thing you figure out is your hypothesis uh, test H0 and H1. So H0 is always, you know, you're going to test the, uh, the null hypothesis is always, uh, you use the equal mark, right? And you test whatever the p-value you they have already given, that's 7%, so you test that. And then H1 is what we are trying to see here. So they say here, we are trying, we are testing this belief. What is the belief? In this season, it is believed that the proportion of pairs that are unfit for sale has decreased. So we are believing that the proportion, the 7%, might have decreased this season. So that's what we are trying to test. So here, H1 should be P is less than 0 0.07. So I take that uh, from this point. Okay, so we are testing to see whether it has decreased. P less than 0 0.07. So then, so this is the basis of our sum. Okay, all right. And then, uh, so find the smallest value of n such that y equals zero lies in the critical region for this test at a 5% level of significance. Okay, so you need to find the smallest value of n such that y equals zero will be in the critical region. So basically, if it's in the critical region, what's the rule? So you can see it's a one tail test, the left side because they're testing the left side, and uh, y equals zero is in the critical region, the probability y equals zero should be less than 5%. Okay, so it should be, I mean, if the value is inside the critical region, then that probability should be less than 5%, right? Because we are testing at 5% level of significance. So this is the requirement. Okay, so I need to find the uh, smallest value of n that can satisfy this. Okay, that can satisfy this as a... Uh, so let's uh, work on this. So you know y equals zero. I can find the probability of y equals zero by using the binomial distribution. So in the binomial distribution, we use the formula n c x p to the power x one minus p to the power n minus x. So here n is unknown. Uh, x value is zero because here my y value, the value it takes is zero, right? Because they ask us to check y zero. So p to the power zero, one minus p to the power n minus zero. And this needs to be less than 5%. Right? So this is what I'm trying to do, and I'm trying to solve for n here. So n c is zero, you should know it becomes, you must know that it becomes one. Okay, so that's a basic rule you learn in P2, right? N, uh, P2 or P3. So you must know any uh, n c is zero is always going to be one. Okay, because you don't have the calculator to you know verify, but you could you know use any n figure here. So 3 c zero or 2 c zero or 10 c zero, all of them are going to be one. Okay, the proof of this uh, is done in the P2 book, I think. Okay. And 0 0.07 to the power 0 is 1. 1 minus 0 0.07, that's 0 0.93 to the power n. So that's the only thing that's remaining. These two guys are going to be 1s. So less than 0 0.05. And I now need to make n the subject. So to make n the subject, you can see I'm using log to both the sides. You can use natural logs or log base 10. Same thing is fine. So I use log base 10. 
and uh, they, then when I use the log, uh, the power n can come in front. So n times log 0 0.93 is lower than log 0 0.05. So again, this is P2. So I think you've done similar questions like this. Log 0. Point, I want to make end of, end of subject log 0 0.93 goes to the other side as a division. So when you take log 0 0.93 to the other side as a division, you can see that the inequality sign has flipped. So uh, do you recall why the inequality sign flips here? Okay, so you should know that log zero point, any figure, zero point of any logarithm figure, so you can type as it is definitely going to be negative. So if you divide the other side, if you take a negative number to the other side as a division, it should flip the inequality sign. You must flip the inequality sign. Okay, so uh, when I flip the inequality, I flip the inequality sign here because I divide by a negative figure. Log zero point nine three is negative. So you can type this out in the cal and I get 48.28. So n is greater than 48.28 means the smallest n value is n equal 42 because any any figure greater than 41.2, so 42, 43, 44, anything is fine, right? So they want the, uh, they ask you to find the smallest, find the smallest value of n. So smallest value of n greater than 41.28. So you have to take integer figures, okay? So n has to be 42, all right? All right, moving on to part B. Uh, test using, okay, in the past, 8% uh, of the pairs grown by the farmer weigh more than 180 grams. This season, the farmer believes that the proportion of pairs weighing more than 180 grams has changed. Okay, so he, the farmer believes the proportion has changed. Now, they have not said whether it's increasing or decreasing. So far, the farmer believes it has changed, so we don't know to which side, okay? Uh, she takes a random sample of 75 pairs and finds that 11 of them weigh more than 180 grams. Test using a suitable approximation whether there is evidence of a change in the proportion. So you are, test, you are testing what? Test using a suitable approximation. So several things to do here. You must use an approximation. Okay. Whether there is evidence of a change in the proportion. Okay, so you're testing whether there's a change, not whether the proportion has become lower or higher, we don't know. But you have to test whether there's a change. All right, so uh, what's the first thing we do here? Okay, so first thing we do here is let's define our random variable. So always define the random variable to make things easier, define the hypothesis, and then let's go for the test. So I'm going to define the random variable x. x is what? So I'm going to say x is uh, the number of pairs number of pairs, so what should be it be? So we are testing whether the uh, weigh more than 180 grams, right? Number of pairs that weigh more than, that weigh more than 180 grams. So this is what, I'm, what I want to see. And then, uh, so what is the proposal? So X follows the what distribution? So again, now you know it's a num number. You are counting numbers. It cannot be a continuous distribution. It has to be discrete, so which means it should be one of binomial or Poisson. So which one is it going to be? So they say in the past, 8% of the pairs are weighing more than 180 grams. So you have a probability. And they say uh, the farmer uh, takes a random sample of 75 pairs, right? So which means you're taking a fixed number of trials, right? So there's no rate uh, There's no rate here. So it, so it goes with binomial. X follows a binomial distribution with N is 75, probability of success 0.5. 0, 0.8. All right. All right. So now what we need to do is they ask you to what? Use a suitable approximation. So, so basically you have to, uh, okay, what's our hypothesis? So my hypothesis H0 and H1. So H0 will be what? Obviously P equals to 0 0.08. Okay, H1 is P equals definitely. And what about H, uh, H0 is P equals 0 0.08. Uh, H1. You know, there are three formats, right? H1 is either P greater than 0 0.08 or it could be P less than 0 0.08 or the other format is P is not equal to 0 0.08. So which one of three should we go with? The earlier case, because they said it was a decrease, we went with less than. But here they say the proportion has changed. So they have not said whether it's an increase or a decrease, but simply it's changed. Changed means you should go with not equal. So it has changed. That's why it's not equal to 0 0.08. So we do not know to which way, but it has. It is now not equal to 0 0.08, which means there's a change. Okay, so you should understand from these uh, wordings here. All right, so this is this means I am working now with not with a one-tail test. We are working now with a two-tail test. 
So we had to check both the sides. Okay. So the next thing they ask us to do is, okay, I've done all of those things here. Now we have to use a suitable approximation. So what is the suitable approximation? So a binomial, you need to either, there are two approximations. You go binomial, you can take it to a Poisson approximation, or you can go from a binomial to a normal approximation. Right, so I think we did one question here in the previous uh, question. And there was a previous question in the same paper, right? Where we had an approximation with binomial to normal. Okay, so let's check. So what's the rule? As I so I'll repeat it again. So binomial to poison, n is large, p is small. Binomial to normal, n is large, p is close to 0 0.05. And the other clue I gave you here is the lambda value, np. Np value, if it is lower than 10, the expected value, if it is lower than or equal 10, then we go with poison, but if it is greater than or equal 10, then if it is greater than 10, then you go with normal. So here, if you take the NP value, the mean, uh, so what is the mean? 75 into 0 0.08. So that gives you uh, uh, 6. That gives me 6, so lower than 10. And clearly you can see N is large. 75 is generally considered large and any value bigger than 50 is large. And P, 0 0.08 is closer to zero, right? It's close to zero. All right, so here we go with a poison approximation. So I go with a poison approximation, which means mean and variance are both equal to lambda. So which means mean and variance must both be equal to lambda. They're both equal to six, because you know in poison, lambda, mean and variance are both lambda. All right, so now let's find the probability. So uh, what do I need to do here? Okay, so I need to check, uh, the question is to check, uh, they have given us, uh, they have found that 11 of them weigh more than 180 grams. There are 11 that weigh more than 180 grams, so we need to check whether 11 is in the critical region or not. So if 11 is in the critical region, then we have sufficient evidence to reject the null hypothesis. But if 11 is not in the critical region, we, have, we do not have sufficient evidence. So if I draw the distribution, so if you have some distribution like this, you have critical regions on either side, right? Two tail test means you have critical regions on either side. The probability for each side, we give 2.5%. Okay, we give 2.5% to either side. Now the question is, will 11 be inside one of the two regions? Is 11 going to be inside or outside? Okay, that's the question. And, and also you need to have decide 11, okay, which tail are we going to test? So I think again, one uh, easy rule to decide which tail to test is, if you recall in your textbook, they tell you, uh, to take the mean. So here you can see uh, the uh, the mean value is, uh, uh, okay. Okay, so uh, one easy rule now to identify, because you, are going to do, you need to do two tests here. So either probability x is less than or equal 11 means you are checking the lower tail. Okay, we are testing, because I want to see if it's inside the critical region. Okay, so x less than or equal 11 means you are taking, you are checking the lower tail. Or you have to take the probability x is greater than or equal 11, which, which means you are taking the upper tail. Now, you don't need to actually calculate both of them. It's not necessary to calculate both of them, right? So the easiest way, I think, in your textbook they've given to you, you take the mean. So here my mean is 6, right? And 11 is bigger than 6. So which means if 11 is bigger than 6, it means your 11 is definitely more towards, it's, it's towards the right end, right? Because the mean is the average, like kind of like the middle value. So 11 is bigger than 6, which means 11 should probably, if 11 is in here, it's definitely somewhere on the right end. It's not going to be in the left end. So there's no point of checking here. So you, this is where you need to check. So you have to check, is 11 going to be inside the right tail or is it outside? So you, the right tail is the one that's of interest here. Okay. So I need to get this probability and see whether is it inside or outside. So probability. Okay. First, let's uh, convert to poison. So the poison distribution, let's say y, y follows the poison distribution with mean 6. All right, so I need to find the probability x is greater than or equal 11, right? So this is the probability I need to find. So you're taking a binomial distribution to a poison distribution. So there's no continuity correction involved, right? Because it's a discrete to discrete, you don't have to uh, any type of correction, right? So you can even write x here, that's fine. Okay, we don't need to do any continuity correction. So basically, x greater than or equal 11. All right. So I need to find this probability now from the Poisson distribution, which is 1 minus probability x is less than or equal to 10. Agree? So 1 minus x less than or equal 10. Lambda value is 6. Let's take the Poisson table. 
lambda value is 6, uh, x less than or equal to 10 is 0 0.9574, right? 0 0.9574. So 1 minus 0 0.9574 is the probability x less than or equal to 10. So, which is uh, 0 0.0426. Okay, 0 0.0426. And now you check it with the 2.5%. Uh, 0 0.0426 percentage wise is 4.26%. So, 4.26% is definitely greater than 2.5%. Do you see? Which means 11 should be what? 11 is outside the tail, right? Because I got the probability x is greater than 11. x greater than 11 probability came up as 4.26%. So 4.26% is bigger than 2.5% because I'm interested whether it's in the critical region, this region, inside the 2.5% area. So you can see 4.26% area is bigger than the 2.5%. So it's 11 is definitely outside the critical region. Okay, so you can say uh, not in the critical region. So it's not inside the critical region means what? It means we do not have sufficient evidence to reject H naught. Okay, you do not reject H naught, but it's saying this is not enough. Okay, uh, so you need to give another statement with respect to the uh, question. So what is the question? They're talking about the proportion. Do we have tests using a suitable approximation whether there's evidence of a change in the proportion? So do we have evidence of a change in the proportion? So I do, we do not reject H0, which means we stay with H0, right? So H1 indicates there's a change. H0 means we're staying with it, right? So uh, we do not reject H0 means I'm staying with H0. So which means do I have evidence that there's a change in the proportion? So we do not. There is no evidence, right? Because I'm staying with H0. So there's no evidence to suggest that the proportion of pairs uh, weighing more than 180 grams have changed. So you need to give that statement. You must give that statement. That's uh, that's one mark. So writing this is not enough. You need to give uh, one statement with respect to the uh, context in the sense whether you are rejecting H0 or whether you do not reject H0. That's one statement. And then other statement you must give with respect to the context of the question. So this is what we are testing, whether there is evidence of a change in the proportion of pairs weighing more than 180. So since I do not reject H0, what do we say? We do not have sufficient evidence. We do not have sufficient evidence to suggest or to say. You can use the same uh, words in the question to suggest that but, uh, there is a change in the proportion of pairs. Use the same wording in the question, so it's easier. Weighing more than 180 grams. All right? So we do not have uh, such evidence. Okay. Okay, so moving on to question number five. The number of particles per milliliter in a solution is modeled by a Poisson distribution with mean 0 0.15. A randomly selected 50 milliliter sample of the solution is taken. Find the probability that exactly 10 particles are found. Okay, so let's write down. So uh, let's define the random variable x. So what is x? X is the number of particles number of particles uh, per milliliter per milliliter of solution so this x follows a poisson distribution with mean 0 0.15 so this is per milliliter all right uh, okay so here they say a random selected 50 milliliter sample of solution is taken so now what's happening uh, we are changing, right? So if you are changing, now let's, I'm going to change the letter to Y. So Y is the number of particles in 50 milliliters. So in 50 milliliters. So Y follows a Poisson distribution. So you know in the Poisson distribution, as you change the length of the interval, the lambda value is going to change. So here, 
the lambda value is 0 0.15 per 1 milliliter, right? This is for per milliliter. So if you have 50 milliliters, so then you have to get the new lambda value. So that should be 0 0.15 into 50, right? Which is 7.5, 0 0.15 times 50. Okay, so y follows the Poisson distribution with mean 7.5. So that's what we should take here. And I'm supposed to find what the probability exactly 10 particles are found in the 50 milliliter solution. So that is with I'm working with the variable y. So y equals exactly 10. We had to find the probability y equals 10. So e to the power minus lambda, lambda to the power x in the sense is y, lambda to the power y over y factorial because I'm using the letter y here, okay? So e to the power minus uh, lambda is 7.5, 7.5 to the power y, that's 10 over 10 factorial. All right, uh, so you can get the answer directly, right? Just typing in the calculator. So you get zero points. So make sure these answers are given to three significant figures at the end of the day. It should be corrected to three SF, right? So if the accuracy is not specified, you give it to three SF, 0 0.0858. All right, this is just typing in the calculator. It's really straightforward. Part two. Find the probability that uh, between 6 and 11 particles inclusive are found. So in this solution, y greater than or equal 6, less than or equal 11. So you have to get this probability. So the easiest way to get this is by using the cumulative tables, right? So probability y is less than or equal 11. You subtract with what? You subtract with the probability y is less than or equal to. So if you need 6 to be included, you should subtract with less than or equal 5. So you should know here less than or equal uh, 11 means you have the y values probability y starting from 0 until probability y equals 11, right? y is 0 plus y equals 1 plus y equals 2 until y equals 11. And here you subtract with probability y equals uh, uh, 0 until probability y equals 5. I mean, these are things that you should already know. So when you subtract, you can see here y0 until y5, the probability is cancelled, and you're going to remain with y equals 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, which is what we need. Okay, so this is just reminding you of what we've already done. So it's not, not required. You all, you should, I think you should know that, right, at this point. So uh, I'm going to take the uh, Poisson table. So the lambda value is 7.5. Poisson table with lambda value is 7.5. So for 11, the probability is uh, 0 0.9208. 0 0.9208 minus y less than or equals 5. Uh, less than or equals 5. So I had to get that again from the table. Uh, that's 0 0.2414, right? 0 0.2414. All right, so you subtract and you can get the answer. Uh, so that gives me 0 0.6794, which is 0 0.679 corrected to 3 SF. Okay. Okay, guys, so uh, in part B, so let me read it again. So they, here we say Petra takes 12 independent samples of M milliliters of the solution. Uh, the probability that at least two of these samples contains no particles is 0 0.1184. Using statistical tables provided, find the value of M. So six marks. Okay. So the way you do this is, first thing is you need to realize, okay, so we are changing the uh, amount. So we are working now with M milliliters, not with uh, uh, 1 milliliter or 50 milliliter, which means you need to change the distribution. So I said X is the number of particles per 1 milliliter, Y was for 50 milliliters. So now if I'm working with M milliliters, I have to give another variable. So I gave the variable A is the number of particles in M milliliters. So then uh, A follows the Poisson distribution and what is the lambda value? So you know for 50 milliliters, we just multiplied the lambda value by 50, right? The 1 milliliter lambda by 50. So here 1 milliliter lambda value by multiply by M, right? Straightforward. So you have to get the uh, new lambda value. And then, so guys, there are a few things for you to realize here. So here, uh, you need to realize, so they said they, there are, they take 12 independent samples and the probability that at least two of these samples. So actually here you can see that you are uh, doing some sampling, uh, you are doing something with the number of samples as well, right? So which means you need to have another variable 
that non, uh, that takes into account the number of samples. Okay, here for A, A is the number of particles in m milliliters. But again, you need another variable that takes into account the number of samples. Okay, so there are two distributions that you need to consider here. Okay, first let me go through this one. So A is the number of particles in m milliliters. And you can see we are interested in this. There are no particles. Okay, so let me find the probability of there are no particles. No particles means A is zero. Capital A should be zero. So e to the power minus lambda lambda to the power x basically here a over a factorial and basically uh, the a value is zero particles means a should be zero. So you can see here I end up getting e to the power uh, the lambda value e to the power minus lambda so which is e to the power minus 0 0.15 m the other guys are all becoming one. Okay so this is the probability that your sample uh, has zero particles. Okay this is the probability that a sample has zero particles. Okay. But now the question says what you, the probability now this probability 0 0.1184 is not given. I mean, it's not given just in terms of the particles. It's given the probability at least two of these samples. So out of 12 samples, you have 12 samples. The probability that at least two of these samples have no particles is 0 0.1184. So now you need to realize, okay, we need to have another variable to take into account, not the number of particles, but the number of samples. So you can see here, I gave another random variable. So you give any letter you want. I gave S. Okay, so S is the number of, now you can see, it's not the particles, it's the number of samples. So S is the number of samples that contain no particles. Can you see? So this is the first thing you need to understand. And then, okay, what distribution does S follow. So what is the distribution? S is the number of samples. Obviously, it has to be either binomial or Poisson, right? So when you're taking number of samples. So in here, you can see we have 12 independent samples and you find the probability at least two of them have no particles. So which means we are working with a binomial distribution because you have a fixed number of trials. So you have 12 samples, right? So you have a binomial distribution with a fixed number of trials, that's 12, and the probability of containing no particles so the probability of containing no particles is what we found here, right? A equals zero, no particles. The probability of having no particles is e to the power minus 0 0.15 m, which is what I got from here, okay? So uh, I, I have that here. So this is the uh, n value and the probability of success, the p is e to the power negative 0 0.15 m, all right? And then they tell us the probability at least two of these samples. So uh, contains no particles. So this is, S is the number of particles, uh, number of samples that contain no particles. So probability S is at least two, means S is greater than or equal to, right? So this is the meaning of at least. At least means S is greater than or equal to, is equal to 0 0.1184. This is for the samples, okay? So probability at least two of the samples contain no particles, that's this, is equal to 0 0.1184. So now what we do here is, this is the most important relationship you need to build here. So I think if you can get to this point, so the rest of the thing is easy. Coming to this point is the challenging part here. Okay, so coming to this point. So you need to understand that this is what you need to do. At least two of these samples means S is greater than or equal to is equal to 0 0.1184. So S is greater than or equal to can be written as 1 minus probability S is less than or equal to 1. Right, so that is... a uh, one of the main rules in binomial, I mean, just use the, uh, the greater than, I switch to less than. So this is the typical rule. And then you can see I just took S less than or equal 1 to the other side. 0.1184, I took it as a subtraction. And then I get here 1 minus 0.1184 is 0 0.8816. So this is the probability S is less than or equal to 1. So they ask us to actually use the statistical tables provided, right? So you are supposed to use statistical tables. So basically, S is less than or equal 1 means I'm now having the cumulative side. I mean, I have the less than or equal probability, which means I can use the cumulative table for binomial. N value is 12. And the less than or equal 1 probability is 0.8816. So what I do is I go for the table. You can see here I go for the binomial. This is the binomial section, binomial cumulative distribution function. And I go to n value 12. Can you see? I go to n value 12. And the cumulative probability for less than or equal 1. So that means I should go to x equal 1. So you can see I'm going to check this particular row. Okay, so I'm going to take this particular row. Okay, so this particular row, less than or equal 1. So you can see all for different probability p values. 
the probability less than or equal one is listed here. So what, what probability will be in precedent? We had probability which is less than or equal one is equal to 0.8816. So you can see I have 0.8816 when P is when the probability of success is 0 0.05. So that's what I wrote here. So the probability of success from the from the binomial tables, the probability of success for 0.8816 should be is corresponding to 0 0.05. Okay, so I'm using the table because they've told us use statistical tables. So that's what I did here. So that's from the table, as I showed you, I got the value 0 0.05. Okay, so clearly uh, from the table, right? So here you can see 0 0.8816, right? This one. Okay, so this one. So that from that I get the P, I figure out the p-value is uh, 0 0.05. All right, and then, so if the p-value, probability of success is 0 0.05, so here the probability of success is denoted by e to the power minus 0 0.15m, right? So that's what we denoted. So uh, e to the power minus 0 0.15m is what stands for p in our binomial distribution. So this is equal to 0 0.05. So from that point on, it's a straightforward uh, calculation to make m the subject. So making m the subject, uh, point minus one, 0 0.15m, I use log to both the sides, and I just take 0 point, no, negative 0 0.15 as a division. And then you can see, you I it to 3SF. So you easily get 20.0. So m means the number of milliliters, right? So 20.0 milliliters. All right, guys, so it's a little bit uh, tricky, but it's uh, just you need to figure out this point. And the rest of the things should be uh, easier to understand. Okay?